Hi there, here we are in video number three. <coughs> I'm sure by now uh, you have grown to uh, recognize the form of these lectures and we're going to be talking about um, what our critters that we've learned about, the echinodermata, look like when we find them as fossils. So without further ado, what do echinodermata or echinoderms look like when we find them in a rock? Uh, first, let's start with the crinoids. Sometimes, especially during the Paleozoic, uh, crinoids are the rock. So some typical examples are shown on the left here. These are all Carboniferous in age. So if you remember, I said that crinoids were particularly successful during the Carboniferous. And you can see that these rocks are made up, um, or a primary component of these rocks is crinoid ossicles. So it's a situation where you have um, these animals disaggregating um, and then collecting in one particular layer and forming the majority of a particular rock. But even when that is not the case, so these um, examples of these are relatively common, we call them crinoidal limestones, but even when that's not the case, crinoids are not unusual uh, fossils in Paleozoic rocks. We often find isolated little bits and pieces of them. And an example of this is shown on the right here. And these are really easy to identify when you get a little bit of ossicle. Um, they can be either circular or um, uh, pentagonal or star-shaped in cross-section. You can see some examples here that have been isolated and removed from the rock. They'll often have this um, radial pattern that you can see here. Um, and they are often stacked up. So you will often find more than one of these um, in a single bit of um, stem. And this makes them look a bit like their packets of polos. So I think they're really easy to recognize for that reason. And bear in mind that they're also made of calcite. So um, this makes them relatively easy to uh, spot and identify when you have one. So that's the crinoids. Uh, we often get those crinoid bits and they're, they're relatively easy to recognize, especially the stems. In terms of echinoids, you sometimes do get whole fossils preserved. There's a really nice example of this based on uh, the Natural History Museum's collections on the left here. It's particularly true in my experience and my whole echinoderm uh, experience of finding fossils of these things is based on work within the UK looking in the chalk. That's where this example is drawn from as well. And finding whole echinoderms within the chalk isn't particularly um, unusual in the uh, southeast of the UK. So if you're ever in, in the southeast, you can find nicely articulated fossils choke, uh, poking out chalk cliffs, for example. Far more common, though, is to find isolated bits of echinoderms. In particular, these will form, uh, these will be bits of the plate or bits of the spines of these creatures. And you can see some examples on the right hand side here of both spines. You can see that spine there, spine there, and of the plates. You can see that here and here. Often on one of these fragments of um, plates, you'll see the perforations for the water vascular system. And the spines are also relatively distinctive because they're often long and uh, sometimes club shaped, but they'll again be made of calcite. Starfish as a whole are relatively rare as fossils, so I'm not really mentioning them here. But as you can see, um, you yeah, look at a piece of rock and there, there, there are no surprises there in terms of these fossils. I will link to these slides from the virtual microscope below, but um, in terms of uh, seeing these fossils in slides, again, it's not too tricky. The gross morphology of these fossils um, in slides is that they are generally round or star-shaped, if they're crinoid stems. You can see examples here and here. Um, they're made of calcite, so they will often um, jump out when you get cross-polar light, so, uh, such as the one that you see here. And um, often, you'll, in terms of the gross morphology, you'll be able to see elongate echinoderm spines as well. Also, um, if you have a really high-powered microscope, you may be able to see the stereome. In high resolution, you can see that sponge-like porous structure of the calcite that really helps one identify um, the members of, of the echinodermata. The top um, example here is a carboniferous limestone, which contains mainly um, fragments of crinoid ossicles and also uh, brachiopod shells. And the bottom one is uh, primarily crinoid ossicles and echinoderm fragments particularly spines. So that's two examples of what these um, fossils look like in slides. So again, nothing too tricky there. I wanted to 
finish this video by highlighting why the echinoderms are useful ge to geologists. And because my other two videos were quite long, there was quite a lot of information there, I've tried to keep this relatively short for you. So we're gonna have a quick whiz through. So um, echinoderms are indicators of their in environmental deposition to an extent. They will show you, for example, that you are in a marine environment of deposition because that's where these organisms live. That's useful, that's good, sweet. But also, Whilst these creatures, um, whilst um, echinoderms, for, for example, are not perfect for biostratigraphy, they often disarticulate and thus they're quite hard to identify at the special le species level. Um, echinoderms are viewed as valuable and, and in, particularly, uh, in particular, echinoids are valuable for Cretaceous and tertiary biostratigraphy. So these are the, the sea urchins. There are pros to them, as well as the cons that I've mentioned. They are often abundant, they're relatively widely distributed, they tend to have a fairly broad environmental tolerance, though it's all marine, and they often have short-lived species. This is especially true of the irregular echinoids, which were undergoing a radiation during the time periods that I've mentioned, and also have higher preservation potential than the regular ones, because they're less likely to articulate, they're already buried right. So you can see an example of Microsta, this species that I've already mentioned, which has been a kind of like a, a, a focus of the study of irregular echinoids on this slide here. Lovely creatures. Uh, also, in some areas, echino echinoids are the only preserved by stratigraphically applicable microfossil during the Cretaceous and, and later rocks. However, because they're not perfect for biostrichophy, this means we often have to use a thing called a, an assemblage zone um, to identify where we are in a stratigraphic col column. With this in mind, I wanted to finish this lecture and this video by introducing different types of biozones. So we've covered in brief um, the fact that biozones exist and in our ammonite lecture, we highlighted that they were um, defined by zone fossils. They often take the name, for example, of a zone fossil. But I wanted to highlight with this example that biozones aren't just limited to the range of one specific fossil species. There are numerous types. The type that I've mentioned in terms of the um, echinoderms within uh, Cretaceous and Younger Rocks is the assemblage biozone. So this is often used uh, um, when you have an association of three or more species. You can see examples of this um, on the right hand side here. Each one of these lines represents the existence of one species and these different biozones are defined by different, um, uh, different collections of those particular species. Um, species associations are strongly dependent upon local ecology, so these biozones are typically only suitable for local or within basin applications. But when it comes to our echinoids, they're pretty useful, right? But there are also a range of other biozones that I want to introduce as part of this um, lecture. Uh, on the We've really looked at assemblage biozones, these are the ones on the right, but there are also a, different, a range of different forms of biozone that are called the interval biozones. The most common two for uh, interval biozones are the local range and the taxon range biozone. This is the, ra the range of occurrence of a single taxon. So you, you can see this diagram diagrammatically represented um, on the top left here. We also have such a thing as a concurrent range biozone. You can see that here. This is the concurrent range of two different species. It's the bits where you find both. So this is a, uh, a fairly, this is a simple form of assemblage biozone where you're just talking about two particular species, but that kind of makes it a tiny bit easier to define than an assemblage biozone. We also have consecutive range biozones. You can see these um, shown diagrammatically here. This is based on the consecutive ranges of fossils within an evolving lineage. Each is defined by the first appearance of a species in a speciation event. So what we're seeing here is the range of a taxon within an evolving phylogenetic lineage. Yeah. And we often use um, for this, rather than the first appearance of two species, we will use the last appearance of um, 
two species. This is shown here, the successive last appearance biozone. So rather than two appearances, we're talking about two extinctions here. This is common in the extractive industries like oil, because when we're drilling down a borehole, we can be sure of the last appearance of, a, of a, say, a fossil, because it's the first time we actually find that when we're drilling downwards in our, in our borehole. We can't be sure of the first appearance because sometimes you get, um, you get uh, contamination from above, bits of rock fall down the hole, and this makes a, a, identifying the first appearance of any given fossil somewhat difficult. I also wanted to highlight that we have a thing called an abundance or an acme biozone. This is defined by the particular abundance of a certain species during a certain time interval, and it's subjective in nature. Um, we all may differ in uh, differing assessments of relative abundance, for example, and that limits the recognition and regional extent of these units, but occasionally in some particular basins, those are very, very useful. So there are all of these different ways of arranging how we can split up um, the, the, the ranges of fossils to identify different zones. I've mentioned that quite briefly here, um, and I recognise that this is slightly tricky, so I'm going to put some more um, resources for you um, just below this video to help you try and get a handle on how these biozones um, actually may work in practice. I wouldn't worry if you don't follow them completely, but I, I do think they are really, really useful tools for you as geologists to know. So if you have any questions about them, please do ask during the uh, lecture. And that's it for um, this particular segment, and I will see you again soon for another lecture.